Thank you all for making time out of a busy uh, schedule and a uh, hectic couple of days, I think, for some of you especially. And so it's a treat to be here. What I'm doing today is I want to sort of share with you, I have a book coming out in the fall called Awaiting the King on Reforming Public Theology. And uh, what I'm giving you today is kind of fresh manna um, about uh, how to think about our uh, Christian engagement for the common good. And so today what I want to talk about is the Christian's posture in public. That's the way I'm going to frame it. I, I, I don't have, I'm not here with policy recommendations. I'm not here with precision positions uh, to recommend or defend. What I'd like us to do is think about our posture, the way we carry ourselves in the current cultural moment, our stance at the, in, in the current time. And since Cardis uh, draws on 2,000 years of social thought, Christian social thought, and since I'm contractually obligated to mention St. Augustine in every lecture I give, <laughs> I will start with the wisdom of St. Augustine, who in his late and important work, The City of God, reminds us that the citizen of the City of God will always find herself thrown into a situation of being a resident alien in some outpost of what he calls the earthly city. I was thinking I should show you my green card. I'm a resident alien of the United States. And there's something, Augustine says, there's something about that, that stance, that posture, that reality of being a resident alien that characterizes a Christian in every age and every generation. Citizens of the heavenly city, he tells us, Quote, lead what we may call a life of captivity in this earthly city as if in a foreign land. It's a very strong language, and yet it's very ancient language that the church has inherited. Now, I would emphasize, I don't think that this demands either some sort of positive, you know, fundamentally rosy account of the earthly city, nor does it turn into some dismissive stance with respect to to political society. The, the political impetus that comes from this recognition that citizens of the city of God are, in a sense, resident aliens is something like, more like, well, I struggle with the language here, but something like a kind of calculated ambivalence <laughs> at times. There will be a certain cultivated aloofness that is tempered then by evaluations of how we can collaborate for the common good. The heavenly city, Augustine emphasizes, is on a pilgrimage. And it's, he says, we don't hesitate to obey the laws of the earthly city by which those things which are designed for the support of this mortal life are regulated. We, we participate, we submit, we work alongside. And in fact, he says, we do this especially so that we can live in harmony even with those who are on pilgrimage to some other end, some other place. So my, my, the way I want to frame this question this morning is this. It's not a question of whether we are resident aliens. It's a question of how. How do we live out our resident alienhood? <laughs> and while the church has spent a generation wrangling about what views we should hold or positions we should advance, and we probably need to keep doing that, I worry sometimes that we've lost our footing and we are sort of slouching towards relevance or we're digging in our heels in defense and we're missing or forgetting something fundamental about this posture of being citizens of a heavenly city who are on sojourn and pilgrimage amidst the earthly city. Let's remember that to worship Christ the King is to be a people with a kingdom-oriented stance, which sometimes I want to suggest is going to make us look aloof and at other times is going to pitch us right into the fray of what we need to be fighting for. So the posture of heavenly citizenship, I want to say, is a posture of uplift. Imagine that it means that we are a people who are tethered by hope to a coming king. Or remember, as Paul reminds us, that it's precisely those who have their citizenship in heaven, chapter 3, who are called to shine like stars in the sky, chapter 2. What we need then is an exercise, I think, in posture correction. Sort of learn, we have to like put books on our head and learn how to walk properly. Posture correction. And I want to boil this down today. There's a lot more that could be said about this. But I want to emphasize three facets of uh, a good posture for public theology. 
Public theology, I want to say, first of all, should be liturgical, but don't get too anxious about th that language if you're a Protestant evangelical. Okay, of course the guy in the collar is nodding. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. Uh, um, so I want to I talk about how and why public theology is liturgical. I want to talk about how and why public theology must be historical, and, and I'll say right up front, I'm probably most passionate about that point today. And then third, I want to talk about why public theology needs to be patient. So first of all, public theology should be liturgical. What, what I mean by that is, I think we need to stop imagining the challenge or the mission of public theology is to somehow connect different spaces. It's not a matter of how to connect the public space of our lives, the market, the municipality, with the private religious ghetto that we retreat to on weekends, right? It's not two compartments, it's not two spaces. The public, I want to emphasize, is already a ritual environment. The public is already a liturgical environment, and the flip side is, the church is already a political space. Don't freak out, I'm gonna explain that in a second, okay? So what's at stake in our public life today and the life of the body of Christ, in both of these, what's at stake in public theology is the dynamics of what I've called formation. What kind of people are we becoming? What sorts of sh beings are we shaped to be? Ultimately, what are we learning to love? What are we learning to chase? What do we think is important and ultimate? And, and if you start to see that our loves and our longings and our, our desires are shaped by the rhythms and rituals and practices that we are immersed in, what I want to suggest is it gives you new lenses for looking at what you might just think is benign daily public life and you realize that actually it's loaded with rival stories about what the good is. It's, 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 uh, um, it's inviting us into scripts that are telling us to love rival gods and serve rival kings. And it's a loaded space that is not neutral and benign, that to be in that space is to actually be given over to a certain kind of formation, and at times we might say a deformation. I think this is one of the ways to um, nuance our account of all the ways that Christianity has become so assimilated to the dominant culture. I don't think we've become assimilated to the dominant culture because we've been convinced by bad ideas. It's because we've been conscripted by rival liturgies. So the public space, the rights of liberalism and consumerism are ritualistic, liturgical uh, 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 rhythms that are doing, they're not just something that we do, they're doing something to us. Does that, does that make sense? But now the flip side. So, th so what I mean to say is, don't let's not imagine that the that the public space is a neutral space. It's a loaded sphere. But now here's the flip side: the church is political, not in the sense of being partisan, not in the sense of being a rival of the state or hoping to devour the state, but in the sense that the body of Christ is an outpost of kingdom come. Sometimes, you know, it'd be interesting to read your Bible with this kind of cool highlighter pen that would just remind you of how political a lot of the language of scripture is, <laughs> right? Whenever we pray to a king, let's just remember that that is a political reality. The church is a polis, Stanley Howard Wass would say. So in that sense then, I also want us to re- imagine what's at stake in our formation in the body of Christ. Worship is the civics of the city of God, where the spirit habituates us as a people to desire the shalom that God desires for creation. So the church isn't just some soul rescue depot that leaves us to muddle through the regrettable earthly burden of politics in the meantime. The church is Christ's body politic that then invites us to imagine politics otherwise. What, a, a part of what I'm making a case for is that the body of Christ, the church, the realities of congregational life are in some ways the most significant professional development program for civil servants. 
Because what's happening there is by giving yourself over to the biblical story in the rhythms and rituals and liturgies of the body of Christ, you are actually absorbing a biblical imagination to then start to imagine how the world is called to be otherwise. The church is a body politic that invites us to imagine how politics could be otherwise. And it's very important to remember that worship ends with sending. We are sent from the body of Christ to be God's image bearers for the world, for our neighbors, which includes ongoing creaturely stewardship and responsibility to order the social world in ways that are conducive to flourishing, and I might say that are particularly attentive to the vulnerable, to widows, to orphans, to strangers in our midst, as scripture puts it. This regenerating and re-sanctifying power of the spirit nourishes a political will that engenders solidarity. It's where we learn to imagine how we could be together again and differently. Peter Lightheart puts it very provocatively at one point. He says this, as soon as the church appears, it becomes clear to any alert politician that worldly politics is no longer the only game in town. It's a signal of how politics could be otherwise. The, the, the social imaginary of the body of Christ is not neutral about the economy or education or human flourishing. To be a part of the body of Christ then is to absorb a vision of how the world could be otherwise, how our common public life could be otherwise, and we are sent to try to bend the broken realities in the direction of that shalom. So in that sense, I want to say public theology is liturgical. However, I, I, now this is the next is public theology is historical. And the reason why this is important is because I don't want this to be heard as setting up church versus world. It's church for the world. It's worship for mission. And uh, um, this second theme then is important. Public theology must be historical. I actually think one of the most important questions we can ask in public theology today is, what time is it? What time is it? Too often, I worry that Christians are idealists, not just in the sense of being utopian, but that we are idealists in the sense that we try to inhabit public life as if it were timeless in a way. That is, we are inattentive to the zigs and zags of history that got us to where we are at this moment in this place all the contingencies of that. We, we don't know what time it is because in a way we don't even keep time. So we just, we kind of disclose what, what are these principles and we keep repeating them over and over again and we are inadequately attentive to the shifts in context in which we are bearing witness. The poet Percy Shelley once said, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. He's probably overstating it, but it's a great line. <laughs> Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Well, if we look around us at the institutions and habits and expectations that characterize liberal democratic society, there is another unacknowledged legislator of the world. It is Christ and his body. This is the, the historical point that interests me. The British theologian Oliver O'Donovan, is that a familiar name in here? Okay, great. One of my missions in life is to uh, introduce people to the work of Oliver O'Donovan. And one of the things that O'Donovan emphasizes is that one of the most important tasks of public theology today is to point out to quote unquote secular societies their very distinctly Christian heritage. That is, what time is it? How did we get to where we are today? It turns out there is a very, very particular history of that in the West, and that history runs through Christ and his body. Political theology in this mode, O'Donovan says, has an apologetic force when addressed to a world where the intelligibility of political institutions and traditions is seriously threatened. Does that world sound familiar to anybody? Anybody? 
a world where the intelligibility of political institutions and traditions is seriously threatened. What's one of the best services that Christians in public can offer to the wider common good is actually to tell the family history of liberal democracy and remind what generated that. Christian theology, he says, sheds light on institutions and traditions to address a crisis that is more pressing on unbelievers than on believers. And so it offers reasons to believe. In this sense, then, public theology, it serves the public by offering a genealogy of its own institutions. And I, I think this, uh, maybe this is the geeky academic in me, but I actually think this is a really, really crucial public function that we can serve. Uh, down in the States, there's a PBS program called Finding Your Roots, which is uh, uh, presented by Henry Louis Gates. And it's this fascinating, it's a, it's a genealogy program where they take both the science of genetics and the archival work of genealogists, and they'll get someone like John McCain or Puff Daddy, or what's Sean Combs called now? Whatever, you know, like they'll take artists and stuff like that, and they'll and they'll basically lay out for them their family history, and inevitably they learn things that they would never have imagined would be true. So John McCain, that war hero who who uh, endured through uh, um, uh, uh, prison in Vietnam, learns that he actually had a, a ancestor who deserted the army. <laughs> Awkward. So what's, what intrigues me, though, is this genealogy function. The public theologian is an institutional genealogist, uncovering the perhaps hidden, maybe to some of our friends, a little bit embarrassing history of secular society. When and where the Christian theological impetus for political realities are shrouded in ancient history or almost actively forgotten for revisionist reasons, the public theologian can be prophetic simply by being an organ of collective memory. The public theologian unveils the family history of liberal democracy with all of its religious grandmothers and Christian uncles. And I, I would say this is this is exactly, I think, what motivates the Faith in Canada and 150 project of CARDIS right now, which is to say the sesquicentennial of Canada, despite all of the fraughtness of public discourse today, is actually a wonderful opportunity to remind a nation that its legacy is very particular and grew out of the zigs and zags of the influence of Christian faith in giving us the institutions that we now prize and value. This is why, now speaking sort of internally to Christian public theology, we can't simply demonize liberalism either. I, and I, I think some public Christian voices are a bit want to do, to do that today. The story O'Donovan tells, he puts it this way, is how modernity is the child of Christianity and at the same time how it has left its father's house and followed the way of the prodigal. It's a very provocative way of putting it, especially then if you remember this. Even the prodigal remains a son. We shouldn't be bolting the door against him, but looking for ways to welcome him back. Or at the very least, we should see family resemblances in this brother. How would that change our posture in public theology? And let me add one particular suggestion in this regard. And I, I, I realize this might be sort of counterintuitive. But when your cultural analysis takes this kind of history into account, you will start to realize that even some of your most vociferous opponents share a family tree with you. In fact, one of the things the, the great Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor um, has told the story in a secular age of how, in fact, what we sort of take what, what's in the water is what he calls the modern moral order, is actually only possible because the West came through the gospel and Christian faith. In fact, the starkest way to make this point would be this. Progressivism is secularized agape. Progressive, if you tell the story Progressivism is a kind of secularized agape. Now, there's all kinds of weird transmogrifications that happen, obviously, in that history. 
But if you start to realize that, in fact, it's it's its own weird inheritance of a Christian impetus that says, I am called to love not only my neighbor, but even my enemy. The universalism of moral obligation that takes us out of tribe and blood. All of that is only possible because of the gospel was an eruption in Western history. And I wonder again, how might that change our posture in public debate? Do you notice it doesn't entail any conclusion, but I do think it changes a posture. It also creates an opening, I think, to show that liberal democracy can't always get what it wants. You, you didn't know the Rolling Stones were public theologians, right? You can't always get what you want. Sorry, can you talk about the Rolling Stones at Cardis? I don't know. <laughs> You can't always get what you want. And what I mean is, it, I think it's become increasingly clear that liberal democracy depends on virtues that liberal democracy can't generate. That baseline common life virtues of tolerance, patience, uh, respect, and dignity that in a way are enshrined in the manifestos and motivations of liberalism are not generated by liberalism. Those are virtues that are inculcated in families and overwhelmingly in religious communities. So what if the church is actually the best hope for renewing liberal democracy? How would that change our posture of engagement? Again, there is a story and a history to be told here. Finally, so public theology should be liturgical. Public theology should be historical. And finally, public theology should be patient. And I want you to indulge me here, because this is a part of my book that I really liked. And so I want to try it out. I want to read the story of Don Quixote as a parable. Now, for those of you who haven't read Don Quixote, you know, you know the phrase tilting at windmills, right? You know that Don Quixote is this kind of crazy guy who thinks he's a knight errant. And, and thinks the, the, the uh, 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 peasant girl beside him is actually a princess that he's rescuing. And his, his sidekick, Sancho, is sort of the straight man in the whole thing who, who also gets the greatest laughs. And so Don Quixote, to be quixotic, of course, is to be like foolish, misguided, mistaken. Well, maybe there will, I, I want to offer a defense of Don Quixote. Because Maybe there will always be something quixotic about the church's politics of hope amidst the grim realism and calculating rationality of earthly city politics. After all, doesn't political theology invite us to imagine the kingdom and await a king who never seems to arrive? Isn't Don Quixote laughable precisely because he's let his perception of the world be framed by his imagination and he's let books fuel his very uh, uh, perception of reality. Don Quixote is almost the poster child for somebody who denies reality because a book, the romances of Arthurian legend, have captured his imagination. Could people talk about Christians that way? You guys, you don't even see the real world. You, you just believe this book. But isn't there something beautiful in Don Quixote that we are all loath to deny. Isn't there, in fact, I would say something deeply gospeled about the knight errant's perception? I want to, uh, again, indulge me for one sec. I want to read one passage from Don Quixote, which is where Don Quixote runs into this peasant washerwoman, and I want you to hear the description of it. As soon as she walked through the door, Don Quixote heard her, and sitting up in his bed, despite poultices and pain in his ribs, he's been beaten up by some people, he extends his arms to welcome his fair damsel. The Asturian, who tentatively and quietly was holding her hands out in front of her and looking for her beloved, collided with Don Quixote's arms. He seized her by the wrist and pulling her to him while she did not dare to say a word, forced her to sit on the bed. Then he touched her chemise, and though it was made of burlap, to him it seemed the finest and sheerest silk. On her wrist she wore glass beads, but he imagined them to be precious pearls of the Orient. Her tresses were rather like a horse's mane, but he deemed them strands of shining Arabian gold whose brilliance made the sun seem dim, and her breath 
which undoubtedly smelled of yesterday's stale salad, seemed to him a soft, aromatic scent wafting from her mouth. In short, he depicted her in his imagination as having the form and appearance of another princess he had read about in his books, who, overcome by love and endowed with all the charms stated here, came to see the badly wounded knight. And the blind illusions of the poor gentleman were so great that neither her touch, nor her breath, nor any of the other good maiden's attributes could discourage him, though they were enough to make any man who was not a mule driver vomit. <laughs> On the contrary, it seemed to him that he clasped in his arms the goddess of beauty. But couldn't you read that like a scene from Hosea and Gomer? Which is also why, doesn't it invoke Christ and us, his bride? And in other ways, it signals, I think, exactly what we, the bride, are called to in the public vocation of the body of Christ, to see in our neighbors and even our enemies what others can't see or refuse to see even if it means enduring their laughter and scorn for how, holding out hope that the world is and can be otherwise. I get it. Don Quixote is laughable, and Sancho is the empirical reality check who keeps us laughing. Sancho's the straight man who soberly tells us like it is, never cracking a smile, making Don Quixote all the more laughable. He's the voice of the shrewd purveyors of realpolitik who dryly remind us of the way things are when we Christ-haunted politicians of hope dare to imagine that the world could be otherwise. To work for justice, laboring to build humane economies and life-giving cities and healthy families and empowering systems of education, that must sometimes look like tilting at windmills in an age of will-to-power political self-interest and cynical power grabs. To imagine that forgiveness and mercy and compassion could make a dent on political systems is the sort of posture that political operatives dismiss with a snicker as naive and benighted. But friends, what parades itself as political realism is somebody else's take on the world that's rooted in some other faith, even when it mostly breeds suspicion, it's oriented to some other hope, even when it takes the form of despair. It's animated by some other love, even though, as Augustine taught us, that default love is love of self and love of power. Which also means that every take that parades itself as realist is contestable. And that a biblical vision for a flourishing polis is not precluded because it's biblical. You see, it all depends on who you think narrates the world. Who's the narrator of our world? What if it's a king who loves us, laid down his life from us, and rose from the dead? Now, granted, there's going to have to be patience here now, because the verification of that, the ultimate disclosure and verification of that, is something we await. It's why one of the things we can't escape as public theologians is eschatology. We don't bring about the kingdom. We are awaiting the king. This is not timid quietism. It's not the resigned waiting of indifference. In fact, as Bethany Huang and Kristen D. Johnson have said in their book, The Justice Calling, they look back to Habakkuk as an exemplar who, lamenting injustice, confronting God, Habakkuk stations himself on a rampart as he waits for God. And Huang and Johnson ask this, what would it mean for us to station ourselves? What could a rampart represent for us? Can waiting itself be an act? Can waiting itself be an act? Our most revolutionary political hope, political act, is to hope. The novelist Marilyn Robinson, who's probably our most public Calvinist today, also in some ways, has succinctly put it this way, fear is not a Christian habit of mind. Fear is not a Christian habit of mind. To be a Christian is to be a, a person who engages in politics, but without fear. You see, fear drives us to panic, and no one makes good decisions when they're panicked. 
We overestimate some threats. We ignore others. We, we can't see clearly, and we're prone to being manipulated by those who would foment our panic. But we ought not to be a panicked people. Our king has told us over and over and over again, be not afraid. You've already heard the good news that brings great joy. The king is alive, is seated on his throne, and he reigns. And not only that, he is interceding for us at the right hand of his father. Be not afraid. Thank you.